Perfect. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to our second and last day uh, of this workshop uh, called Identification of Disease Associated Genetic Variants from Next Generation Sequencing Data. Uh, that is hosted by the uh, International Society for Computational Biology in the Latin American Symposium and facilitated by uh, Welcome Genome Campus Advanced Courses and Scientific Conferences. So today we want to start with uh, uh, module number three. So if you remember yesterday, we had two modules. Uh, the introduction where Caro talked to you about sequencing technologies, uh, you know, different steps for library preparation, how they work uh, and what kind of data you get. And then I talked to you about uh, quality controls, how to interpret these files, and then applying these quality controls. And then we did some exercises, uh, the second part of the day, related to uh, uh, QC assessment and, and data formats. So today, the day will be structured in this way. So I'm going to start with this lecture. It's going to be more or less an, an hour. And then we'll have two hours and 15 minutes to do the exercises associated to variant calling. And then we will finish today with uh, a closing presentation by uh, Caro as well. Okay, so, uh, right, so let's begin. So uh, in, this talk, in this talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, variant calling, the variant calling uh, methodology, the theory behind it, how it works, uh, and how we apply it to detect uh, SNPs and short tails. Okay, so uh, to remember what we were talking about yesterday, we have, uh, uh, an, this is a, a very established workshop, uh, work, workflow, sorry, for uh, generating variants from next generation sequencing data. So we have a sequencing instrument and then we, uh, we put DNA in it, but to, to be sequenced. But what do we have to do before? So we, we, we have steps for library preparation. Uh, we have DNA extraction from our sample, for example, we fragment this DNA, uh, we ligate adapters to it, we amplify it in the, in the tile, if you remember, and then this is the thing that can be interpreted by, by uh, uh, the sequencing instru instrument by um, uh, fluorescence and optical detection, if you remember the classes yesterday, and it will give us, uh, uh, at the end, a FASTQ file. Now, um, this, this FASTQ file then, uh, as you if you remember, includes bases, the actual bases and the quality, the qualities associated to each of these bases uh, in, in, in a read. And uh, this, if you remember, were uh, in the ASCII uh, minus 33 code, uh, uh, um, uh, Fred scaled. Right, so once we have this FASTQ file, uh, we perform sequence alignment. And this is uh, the process of identifying where in the reference genome these reads came from. Uh, and this is this, is, uh, uh, this step of, 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 of read mapping. And the, at the end, we will have, if you remember, a BAM file or a SAM file or a CRAM file, which are all equivalent, just different uh, um, compression uh, methods. And after we have a BAM file, then we do the process that we're going to talk about today, that is a variant calling. And this is a process to identify uh, uh, variants against the reference genome uh, for, uh, in our samples uh, uh, to detect uh, then later, for example, variant uh, disease associated, associated variants. Uh, so we do the variant calling. And after that, there comes a post-processing workflow in which we uh, can perform annotations. So for example, I try to, to predict what uh, consequences these mutations or these variants have. Uh, for example, if it alters a protein uh, or, or it stops, uh, uh, you know, has a, a stop gain in, our, in the protein structure, uh, we can perform filtering uh, to just keep the, the variants we're interested in. It can be by quality, it can be by a certain characteristic that we're interested in. And then we, now that we have a high quality set, then we perform a, a downstream analysis to try to identify what we're interested in. So this is more or less uh, uh, the, the workflow that you would follow to, to, to do, to go from reads, uh, raw reads to uh, your disease associated variants. Now, there are different kinds of genetic variants that you can find uh, in, in when you do this experiment. So the, the simplest of them uh, are SNPs or SMVs. So these are single nucleotide variants and we call it a SNP, so a single nucleotide polymorphism if it has been seen in other populations. Uh, so it is a polymorphism, it is, it is you know, uh, somewhat frequent uh, in, in other populations. And we call it a, a single nucleotide variant or variation 
if we don't know that and we have only seen it in our sample, right? So uh, that's just the difference uh, between uh, the terminology there. But it's the same thing, basically, at the DNA level. It is a change of one nucleotide. Uh, uh, for example, if your reference is T, then you have, um, in your read, you have a C, then that is a, a single nucleotide variant. Now, you can also extend this and have multi nucleotide polymorphisms. And these are strings of, of, of variants uh, uh, that are all together. So, for example, you can have here uh, a C2T followed by another C2T. So, uh, this is a doublet and it is called uh, you know, a TT variant. Uh, and that can be you know, extended to many other uh, 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 nucleotides that you can have. Uh, and this may be caused all of them by the same process. So for example, uh, this C, C to T uh, you know, in a row can be caused by ultraviolet radiation, for example. So um, uh, you can detect this as well. And they are different from, from, uh, from the single nucleotide polymorphisms. Now, in those are uh, short insertions and deletions. So you will have, uh, for example, if you have your reference at the top and your, your read from your sample at the bottom, uh, you can have a deletion of a T here, as you see here, you have a T here and you don't have it in your read, or you can have an insertion, for example, here of a G that was not in your reference. Uh, and then finally, you can have a larger uh, structural variants, as they are called, as there are larger sections of the genome that are uh, altered in your, in your sample. So if you have something like, uh, you know, these three sections of the genome all together in your reference genome, ABC, you can have a large deletion, for example, if you, if you lost this large segment B, uh, you can have a large insertion of a different segment, for example, here B. You could have an inversion as well of, you know, the orientation of, of segment B as compared to the reference and other uh, more complicated uh, uh, changes, for example, where, where you have a, 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 this uh, CB instead of BC or, or a copy of, of one of the sections after uh, another uh, fraction. So all of these variants um, you can find in your data, but you need to be careful as to what you want to detect when you run your algorithms, because you will need different programs to detect these different kinds of variants. So usually the same program can detect uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, multi-nucleotide polymorphisms, and short insertions and deletions, because they, they really depend on the alignment of the read to the reference genome, but you will need a different kind of of uh, algorithm when you want to take structural variation because they're much larger than the, than the size of the reads. And uh, that means that you, it, it will depend on, if you remember yesterday, we're seeing the insert size uh, that was uh, inferred from your, from your data. So if you have reads that are, the mates are mapping much farther away or much closer than you expect, then that is a hint for structural variation. So those, those programs work uh, uh, different and take into account different kinds of data for this. Okay, so going into now the process of variant calling, we have some terminology uh, that is usually what we uh, refer to as things. So let's do them here. So the goal of variant calling is to determine the genotype at each position in the genome. So what is genotype? In the broad sense, uh, it is the gen just the genetic makeup of an organism, right? But in the narrow sense, which is what we're interested in here, is uh, the combination of alleles at one position. So you have one position that you're looking at and you want to know what the alleles are at that position. Uh, if you have a diploid organism, so that means two chromosomal copies, then uh, you can have the reference allele, which means it's the same one as the, ref of the, uh, the genome of reference, or an alternative allele, right? Just a different allele. And if that's the case, then, and you have two chromosomal copies, and you can only have three possible genotypes, right? So you can have two copies of, of the reference genotype. So that's called um, a homozygous reference genotype. And we will uh, call that RR, so reference reference. You can have one and one, so a copy of the reference allele and a copy of the alternative alleles, and we will call that a heterozygous. Or you can have two copies of the homozygous alternate. And uh, here it is represented in this, in this alignment below. So if your reference genome is in blue, as you say here, then you can have two re, uh, your two uh, chromosomal copies here below. And if you, if you see, for example, this, this position here, it is the same as the reference genome. Both of my alleles are the same. So I say, okay, this is a CC. That means it's a reference reference. In the VCF, if you remember, uh, we have numbers to refer to the alleles. So zero was a reference allele, 
One was the first alternative allele, two was the second alternative allele, etc. If you remember, we saw this yesterday. If not, go back and, and check it again. Uh, but then in the BCF notation, then that would be zero, zero, zero slash zero. And how many alternative alleles do I have? Zero. So that's the dosage, right? If we look at this position here, uh, so the reference genome is a C, but I have a C, right? So I have an alternate and a reference. In the BCF, this would be uh, one slash zero or zero slash one and I have one alternate allele. Whereas in this position, I have two Cs and uh, the reference is an A. So that means I have alternate, alternate. Uh, uh, the BCF will be one slash one and I have two alternative alleles, right? So this is how we represent these uh, in the notation for these files uh, when we work with them in BCFs. Okay, so um, another thing that we need to take into account is what we what our experiment is is trying to detect so if we're working with uh, germline variants that means populations for example variation between populations or heritable uh, uh, variants for example uh, trios you know these these uh, father mother child then we're looking at germline variation right uh, and when you're working with humans in german variation you are expecting to have just two alleles, as we saw, right? Uh, and, and there's an expectation for your variant calling algorithm as to what to expect if you only have two alleles. However, if we're working with somatic mutation, for example, uh, that would be uh, tumors or other types of, of uh, uh, somatic non-germline variation, then this expectation is not there anymore, right? So in tumors, you do not expect, you cannot expect to have a diploid genome because you have aneuploidies, you can gain a chromosome arms, so you can have three copies, four copies, or zero copies of, of, uh, of an important var uh, variant or a position in the genome. So the program will be different because it cannot have the same expectations as your uh, germline caller. So um, uh, more formally, for uh, here in germline variant calling, we, uh, the algorithm will expect the following fractions of alternate alleles in the phylum. So Alternate alleles, we're counting alternate alleles, the, the, the fraction of alternate alleles in your reads, right? So if you have a reference, genotype reference to reference, you expect 0% of your reads of that position to be uh, alternative, right? So 0% plus sequencing errors because sequencing errors always exist. If you have uh, all of, both of your alleles there are alternate, then you expect that 100% of your reads will be alternate alleles plus sequencing errors. And if you have uh, uh, a heterozygous genome, then you expect 0 0.5, so 50%, but uh, you need to add some random variation of binomial sampling because you have two chromosomes and you're sampling them uh, uh, probabilistically, right? But you expect something in between. Whereas for somatic, any fraction of the alternative allele, uh, the alternative allele is possible because you can have all of these subclonal so variations of mixture of normal cells, uh, polyploidy, aneuploidy, etc. right? So I, I make this uh, I stress this because uh, you cannot use the same program to detect your variants uh, for cancer, for example, and for, for a normal variant. So just, just be sure of what you want to detect so uh, you, can, you can apply the best, uh, the best algorithm for it. Okay, so let's take this alignment that we have here and look at it more closely. Let's assume that we want to do variant calling in this little alignment that I have here. So I have this reference genome in blue, and let's let's uh, assume that I have all these reads. Right, this came from my from my sequencing instrument, and and I have already mapped them to the to the reference genome, and this is how they map. So the first thing I can do is to count the uh, the allele, the alleles. Right, I have the reference and the and the alternative, so I can start. Okay, so the reference here is an A. What do I have here? Three A's. Okay, so I have three reference zero alternates. Right, and I can do that with uh, you know, the rest of them, just count them. Then to decide if I have a, a, a variant there, I could think that I can apply something like a hard threshold, like this one that, that is in this table. So I can say, okay, if I have less than 20% of my, of my reads have an alternate allele, I will just assume those are errors and I'm gonna call this a homozygous reference. If I have anything in between, between 20 and 80% of, of uh, allelic, uh, alternative allelic fraction, then, we'll, then I will assume this is a heterozygous, and then anything above that is a homozygous variant. So if I apply this to this alignment, I can predict the dosage 
uh, of the alternate allele. So here, you know, zero, well, zero divided by three is zero. So that's a homozygous reference, et cetera, et cetera. And then I come here and I say, oh, okay, I have um, uh, two uh, reference and four alternatives. So if I make this division of how many alternatives as a fraction of the total, I fall in between. So I, I say I have one out of the two being the alternative allele and et cetera, right? So, you know, all of these very nice and very simple. However, uh, if you remember from everything we did yesterday, you can have a low quality base. Remember, uh, this, is, this is a graph we saw yesterday in which, you know, the, the quality of the bases uh, diminishes with the cycle. So maybe you will have a lot of errors of, of base being correctly called at the end of your reads. And you may want to take into account when you, when you do discounts. So you can say, okay, fine, I'm gonna apply a filter in which I'm gonna filter base calls by quality. So I'm gonna ignore all the bases that have quality less than 20. Again, a Fred quality score, and here is how you interpret that. So then I start, okay, if this is a, a low quality base, uh, now I only have two, right? Instead of three, because I'm not counting this one, but that's still a homozygous reference. But I can apply these now, and, and now I have more calls than I had before. If you have, or, or a different one, actually. I still have uh, four, but they're different ones. So this one stops being a, a, a variant, and I call a new one here, right? Just because I, I excluded some bases in this calculation. Now, I can also think of filtering uh, reads that actually do not map very well to the reference genome. Remember yesterday we were seeing some reads that have a, a mapping quality of zero, and that means they map to different places in the genome. So I may want to remove that because they're not giving me very high quality information about that site. So if I now add that and remove these two reads that have um, low, low mapping quality, then you know this changes again, and now I find two uh, sites that are actually homozygous alternative, right? So you could think of doing this, and this is something like uh, it will come logically to you to do, but uh, this method has a lot of problems. So the first one is that it undercalls heterozygous in low coverage data. This is because if you have three or four reads, so low coverage, you will not reach these thresholds uh, that you need to call a, a heterozygous, right? So you will you will make errors because you don't have enough depth. That's the first problem that you can have uh, here. And then you can throw away information due to all these very high quality thresholds that is associated to have, having no measure of confidence. So you really don't know how sure you are that that is the actual genotype at the site, right? So because of these, uh, uh, this method is, as I was telling you, very logical, but no one in the real world uses it because this is very you know, naive and, and doesn't loses a lot of information that you could get from the streets. Okay, so in real life, uh, you have uh, different calling models. Uh, some of them are what we call heuristic. For example, Varscan, maybe you have heard about this, uh, this variant color that is very famous. Uh, so these type of variant colors, uh, heuristic variant colors apply a set of filtering criteria for deciding where, whether a variant is likely to be real. Uh, but you, they do apply you know, a very large number of these metrics to try and determine you know, if a variant is real. So they look at things like overall coverage at the site, the number of supporting reads, the average base quality, uh, how many strands you observe at each allele. You also have many different thresholds on coverage and quality and variant frequency, uh, the minimum number of reads, et cetera. So they extend, let's say, this naive variant calling into a more complicated set the filter and criteria to try and determine whether a variant is likely to be real. So that is one of one class of, uh, of programs, of variant calling programs that you will find, and they will have some advantages and disadvantages, and we will see uh, uh, that later. Now, uh, the most used methods for variant calling are not heuristic models, are actually probabilistic uh, uh, variant calling uh, methods. And why is this? So, if you think about it, the sequencing of two mixed molecules of DNA, which is what you're doing, is a probabilistic event, right? Because you, you, you are sampling these two molecules at random, let's say. So uh, it is a probabilistic event. And also, the occurrence of errors in sequencing and in previous developed process is also probabilistic. So a more informative approach uh, uh, has to include information about 
the prior probability of a variant occurring at the site that you're looking at, for example, the amount of information that you have supporting each of the uh, potential genotypes, etc. So more sophisticated models, for example, uh, some tools and pileup, which is uh, what we'll be using in this course, and the GATK haplotype color, which is one of the most widely used methods for calling actually our uh, um, Bayesian uh, methods. Right, so uh, they use ba Bayes theorem, as you can see it here, if you remember from your uh, statistics class. So uh, basically what they're trying to calculate is the posterior probability probability, as you see it here in green, of a genotype given the sequencing data, which is D, and represented here as D. And this is given by uh, the product of a prior uh, genotype uh, probability and the genotype likelihood, and we will see what this, what this is, uh, divided by uh, a constant. This constant is just a factor to normalize the sum of all posterior probabilities to one, and it is constant uh, throughout all possible genotypes. So you, you can actually ignore a little bit this, this, uh, this term. So they apply this formula, you know, calculate the genotype, uh, the probability of the genotype, which is what you're looking for given the data, to try and determine the most likely genotype. So they actually apply this formula to all possible genotypes. So if you're looking at diploid uh, germline data, then these programs will calculate, you know, I have a set of reads. How likely it is that they came from a reference reference uh, uh, genotype? How likely is it that they came from a reference alternative? And how likely it is that they came from an alternative alternative? And then we'll take the highest probability and it will say, this is, you know, what I think is the, the genotype at that position. And uh, the nice thing about this is that you can also calculate the genotype quality. So how sure are you that that's actually a genotype at that position? Because you can also calculate this quality score based on this probability that you have here. So if the probability is very high, so, so you know, uh, you're, you're almost sure that this is a genotype at that, at that position given the data, then this formula will actually go, you know, very high, right? So the higher the quality, the higher the probability. And, uh, and, and in this way, you can now assign a, a quality or, or, you know, how likely, how sure you are that that's actually the genotype of that position. And this is very useful also for filtering afterwards. Now, let's look at this, um, at this formula a bit, close, a bit more closely. So in blue, you have the genotype likelihood, as you see here. So the genotype likelihood can be interpreted as the probability of obtaining the sequencing reads that you're seeing in your alignment given a particular genotype. And it is calculated from the quality scores that are associated with each read at, at, at that site that you're considering, uh, and then multiplying these across all existing reads. Uh, so, you know, it is just a, a formula and it's basically based on the quality and the qualities and the alignment you have at that site from the reads. Now, um, it, do, it does calculate that for all the possible genotypes. And again, this is important to consider, this is why it's important to consider which program you are applying, because some programs will just assume that there's three possible genotypes like these three, and that will not be very good for cancer data. So you have to uh, take into account this before you just run any variant color, because you need to check the assumptions of that, of that color on your data. Um, so uh, it will, try to calculate which of the three genotypes in the case of germline calling is the data most consistent with. Uh, and it will take into account base calling errors, mapping errors, uh, statistical fluctuations and random sampling as we were seeing, this is a probabilistic sampling of two molecules and also on uh, local in the realignment. Uh, and we will see this in a later slide that it is important to take into account uh, for this. Now, you also need, as you see this, uh, this yellow uh, term here, you need to, to take into account as well the prior probability. And this is uh, how likely is it to encounter a variant base in the genome? Uh, this is important because uh, at some sites, for example, may be polymorphic as, as we know they are. So if you find a variant there, you have a higher prior, so a higher probability that it is true just because you have seen it before than a site that you know, has not been found ever to be mutated in, in, you know, in populations, right? So you can adjust that uh, prior probability uh, depending by site, for example, uh, uh, by taking into account things like the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium 
uh, which will assume the probabilities of different uh, um, genotypes depending on the on the uh, allelic uh, allelic um, frequency of, of that alternative allele. And uh, that's why they can take into account the genetic diversity in a population. Or if you don't know, uh, you, you know, if, if you don't have uh, these catalogs uh, of, of variation from other populations, you can just set a uh, um, constant prior to all the sites in the genome, right? So, so you just say, well, the probability of finding a variant is uh, one over, I don't know, 10 to the eighth or something, and, and that's your prior. So the thing is, you can actually adjust this uh, to suit what you're what you're trying to do. And as you can see, then this is a very powerful method that will uh, give you the probabilities or, or you know the likelihoods of all uh, your possible uh, genotypes, and also will give you uh, well the most likely and also a quality score associated to it. So uh, this is really what most variant colors that are used nowadays, like the GATK like uh, uh, VCF tools or sound tools and pilot uh, use. So this is probably what you will encounter in real life when you do it. Okay, so uh, just looking more or less at our, how we will be calling in, in the exercises and how you would do it with uh, this uh, VCF tools algorithm. So what you need for, for doing a uh, variant calling exercise is an alignment file. So your BAM file and your reference sequence. And as we have seen before, it will output a VCF call, uh, sorry, a VCF uh, file or a BCF, so it's the binary uh, version of it. Uh, and you run it like this uh, for, for the VCF uh, tools example, uh, in which you, as you can see here, give it the, the fast day or the reference here, your BAM file here. And then this instruction will calculate the genotype likelihoods that we saw in the previous slide. And this one, the call will actually make the decision given those likelihoods as to what is the most likely genotype, right? So that's why you separate it into, into uh, commands. Now, this, in this command, you can, you can adjust many different um, parameters to suit what you're looking for. So for example, you can increase or decrease the required numbers of supporting risk for indel calling, right? So you can, you can be very strict or you can be very lax depending, for example, if you're gonna validate everything uh, all your calls af uh, after you do it. So in that case, maybe you can be permissive or uh, uh, if you don't have that possibility, you may want to be more strict, right? So, so that's, that's what these options allow you to do. You can also control which basis to take into account. So uh, here uh, we will, if, you, if we say minus Q30, we will ignore all the bases that are uh, with a lower base quality than 30, as we were seeing in the naive, in the naive exercise. We can also apply this back realignment step. We will see in a slide what this is, but basically it is to um, uh, diminish the number of false positives uh, calls around indels because aligning indels is very hard. And, and, and because they're usually aligned in, you know, wrong, uh, a lot of uh, variants that are detected around them are actually false positives. And we will see an example of that. Uh, but you can, you can modulate if you want to, to uh, take that into account or not. Uh, and you can also uh, uh, choose what output you want to, to have from your program. Uh, you can also increase or decrease the prior probability. So what we were talking in the, in the previous slide, you know, if you want to, to be permissive and say, you know, I, uh, there's a high probability that there will be mutations at all sites in the genome that you can increase that, or you can be also uh, very strict and decrease it and not many calls will be made. So. All of these steps you can play with and you can um, you can count the number, for example, of variants that you have if you move this. And because of this, again, it is very easy to just run a program and get a set of calls. And you don't really know if these are, if these are you know, this is a, a correct set of calls or if, it, if it's enriched in, in uh, true positives versus false positives, for example. So it is advisable to take time to understand all of these options. And, and basically you, you, it is advisable that if you're gonna do this, you run it with different parameters and you can see, okay, how many variants do I have with these against that? And do they overlap, do they not overlap? What is the characteristics of the variants that uh, are here and are not here? That kind of thing will help you understand how these programs work and you know, help you maximize the number of, of uh, true positives. 
we will also see later how to um, how to check if your if your set of goals is um, enriched in true positives, right? So so there are methods to do this, and we will see them later in this presentation. Okay, so uh, there are several factors that you need to consider in calling. As we were saying, many of these calls will not be real, so you do need to apply filters. Uh, and these false calls can have many causes. So for example, you can have contamination. And uh, in the case of contamination, you can imagine that maybe you have three or four alleles at one site when you expect only two, for example, because you know you have a contamination of other source. Uh, you can have PCR, PCR errors and uh, these sequencing errors that we were talking about yesterday when you have uh, these uh, a, 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 for example, uh, um, uh, segments, then uh, uh, it, sometimes the sequencing fails there. And, uh, and you, you will have problems in alignment. In alignment, uh, you will have mapping errors if there's repetitive so, uh, regions in the genome uh, or structural variation that you cannot map with short reads very well. And uh, alignment errors when, as we were talking about uh, before, you have indels that are hard to align. Uh, so you will have loads of false positives around it. Okay, so now I like to make this a little bit interactive for our, our um, <laughs> for uh, the the uh, attendants and uh, the participants, and I want to ask you a few questions. You know, it's like a little quiz, and if you have an answer, please let me know about what you think. Okay, so this is this is just things that can happen in your experiment, uh, and uh, you will, we can discuss. You know, if, if this is real or not. You know, real calls or not. Okay, so look at this graph. Uh, this graph is telling you in your sequencing experiment, this is just genomic coordinates, so it's a position in the genome in the x in the x axis, and the coverage that you see um, in your BAM file, for example, so you know how how many reads are mapping to that site. So the first thing that can happen is that you observe things like this, in which there is a region that has a very 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 high coverage. So why can that be? Does anyone have any ideas? Wake up. <laughs> uh, a duplication. Ah, uh -huh. so I can, yes, so you can have a duplication where? <laughs> In your genome or your, or, or the reference, or where are you, are you uh, thinking that it could be a duplication? Uh, in my uh, genome. In your genome, in your sample, right? Uh -huh. So it can be something like that, indeed. So um, in this case, you can have a duplication in your in your uh, sample, which would be kind of the same thing here, saying the reference genome is not complete. Uh, that means, for example, you have two copies and the reference genome only has one, right? So um, uh, it could be because you know the reference genome is wrong uh, and is not representative of all the humans in in the planet. So you may have many more copies of a site uh, than the reference genome, and, and if that's the case, then you will see peaks like that. Uh, so for variant calling, uh, for, to avoid uh, regions like this where you're actually you cannot call against the reference because the reference does not have those two sites, you can filter uh, the calls that have a very high depth. Uh, to try and, and, and remove uh, these kinds of artifacts when you are not aligning correctly to the reference. Well, because the reference doesn't have it. Okay, so yes, that was very good. That was a, a, a correct answer. Now I have another one here. So look at this alignment. Uh, this is IGV. We will be using IGV today. So if you're not familiar with these kinds of graphs, do not worry, we will see them today. But basically what you have here is a reference genome at the bottom and you have your reads a line, you know, uh, one of the bound files is at the top and one another bound file is at the bottom. But the one at the at the top uh, comes from RNA-seq data and the one from the bottom comes from DNA data. And as you can see, the RNA-seq data has some variants that the DNA one does not have. So anyone has any idea why this could happen? Like, why, why do you think you have novel variants in your... Um, in your reads from the from the um, RNA seq. Could be based the amination. It could be real. You are right. Uh, so that is a possibility. But 
this is too many of them, <laughs> right? So vasodilation and and you know post uh, transcriptional modification is not that common. So it it happens, but uh, uh, this is more uh, related to an artifact to an error. But it, it can happen. What you're saying for sure. It's just that when you see it, you know, so many of them in the same space, you have to suspect something is happening, right? So you can see some of them definitely. But in these cases, there's something erroneous going on. And I was just There is a comment in the chat as well, Daniela. Ah, uh, oh, sorry, I can't see them. What, what, what is it? Can someone read it? Sorry, I have the presentation. <laughs> Am I really editing? Uh, oh, so is this is something similar? Yes, it could be RNA editing. As I was saying, that is a real phenomenon, of course, but it's not, let's say, not a lot of bases are edited in this way. Like you don't see, you know, all of this all together. So I can go ahead and tell you in this case. So what is happy, happening here is that the reference genome has, you know, um, uh, a, a gene that is transcribed and then it has a pseudogene uh, in another place that is very similar to that transcribed gene, but it is not transcribed. So when you have DNA data, because it's DNA, you have from both regions, right? Because it's all DNA and you map them back and you usually map correctly. But when you have RNA, you only have from one of these regions, uh, you know, data from only one of these regions because just one is transcribed. So when you map back, because it's very similar and you have a lot of identity to that site, some of the reads will actually be mapped to uh, the pseudogene. Uh, uh, so, and you know, this is incorrect because that part of the genome did not give rise to, to uh, RNA uh, reads, right? So this is why you're seeing in this case, uh, these SNPs that are not real. It's just that this is a mapping error. It's, these reads are not coming from that site, right? So this is common, actually, if you see this pattern, of course, it can be real, as you as you were saying, but before assuming that it is real, you need to assume that it may be an error. And once you have discarded that it is an error, then you say, okay, this is real, right? But in this case, just just looking at you know your your experiment, you may say, actually, it, it's just a mapping error because I, I only have uh, reads from one of these sites, and because they're very similar, they're being mapped to both of them. So um, this just goes to say, uh, you have to be careful with mapping errors, uh, especially with RNA seq data, because it can it can go to where uh, it didn't it didn't uh, come from, and you will see SNPs that are not real, right? Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, to to those of you that are familiar with the IGV, as I was saying, um, look at this alignment and 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 tell me, do you think this? is a valid call. So this is a, va a real variant. And uh, can give you a hint to look at the orientation <laughs> of the reads. Is there anything weird that you notice then going on? And they posted in the chat that no. <laughs> it, is, it is not a valid it's call. Not right? It's not a valid call. But it's why is that? It's not aligned properly. Um, it is aligned properly, actually. Uh, this is not the problem this time. Uh, the the clue is really on on the um, on the orientation of the reads. So if you see, for those that that are not familiar with these graphs, uh, what are what we're seeing here is the first you know half of these reads are all aligned in the forward orientation. So that's what this little um, uh, arrow uh, is telling us. And the other ones that do not have the variant are all, as you can see here, or nearly all, in the reverse orientation, right? So you can imagine that if you have a real call, it will show up in both orientations because it doesn't matter if you sequence in this way or in this way. If the variant is real, it will show up in, the, in your data. So uh, the answer to this is, well, no, it is not a, var it is not a real call. Uh, and uh, the call is supported by, by forward reads only, as we were seeing here. So um, if you see this, uh, you, can, you can assume that it is a bias that came from uh, the sequencing step or, or, or some step before it, but it is not real. And you can filter that in your data set. This is why it's important to also make these uh, the filters after your, your, your calls. Um, 
uh, using things like a, a feature test, right? So, so you can say how many alternative and how many reference and how many forward and how many reverse. And if that is, you know, not significant, this, this uh, uh, feature test, then you can say the, the call passes this test. Otherwise, if you see that all of your reads that are uh, with the variant are all reference, uh, sorry, forward reads, then you, you can be uh, wary that there's something wrong going on there. Because again, a real call, a real variant will show up in both directions. And this is very common, this strand bias. So uh, also you have to um, take that into account when you do your calls. Okay, so um, in order to um, try and detect these, these uh, problems uh, in IGV, again, we will use IGV today. Um, you, can, uh, you can change how you, how you visualize these reads or these, yeah, these maps, this mapping to their reference. So uh, first you can say, okay, I see a site where I see some uh, variant, va variant reads. In this case, there are these uh, red the spots here. So you can say first, okay, I'm gonna sort them. So uh, that means please IGV put first the, the, the reads that have the variant. And then you can say display the soft clip basis. Remember yesterday we talked about soft clipping and hard clipping. Soft clipping and hard clipping were uh, basis, fractions of your read that could not align to the reference genome, remember? And in the case of a soft clip base, you kept the information. This is why you can display it here. If this, if this was hard clipped, you, I mean, it would be the same, it didn't align, but you wouldn't have the bases here to see them, right? So that's the difference between soft clip and hard clip. But when you tell, IGB does not by default show you those bases, but when you tell it display, you say actually, all of the reads that have that variant have this large amount of bases that do not map to the reference. And also they are the same bases as you can see here. So, you know, uh, um, uh, blue is C and, and A is green and whatever. So actually you can be suspicious that these reads are coming from another part of the genome because they're really the same, as you can see, it's the same reads here and they all have this variant, but they're not aligning very properly here. Whereas all the reads here below that do not show this uh, variant also don't have the soft clip reads, right? So when you visualize in this way, you can also discover when there's a, a false call, right? So um, when you have too many soft clip bases in a region that suggests a mapping error, as we were saying. So you have to, to be careful of that as well. Right, here's another one. Variant distance bias. So again, this is RNA and DNA data. Uh, at the bottom, we have the reference. Then we sequence the genome and we sequence two replicates of RNA-seq. And uh, we see again, these, these variants in the RNA-seq data. So what do you think is happening here? Also look at the bottom here, we have exons, right? So the exons are these squares here that are full and the introns are just this uh, line here. That's how IGV displays them. So what do you think is happening there? Any ideas? Anyone that has worked with RNA-seq? I can tell you then, very quiet. So um, basically what's happening here is that this is the end of, well, of a read. And when you sequence uh, RNA, again, remember you remove the introns. So when you're sequencing RNA, you're just sequencing exon, exon, exon together. So here's the exon and this all aligns very well because this exon does align to this part of the genome. But this bit here that has all these, uh, 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 variants that seem variants actually do not map here. They come from the next exon that is after this whole intron, right? But because it is the end of the read, it is easier for the for the uh, for the program to just put it here because it's less expensive than opening opening a big gap, for example, and, and mapping just a little basis somewhere, you know, else. So. Um, 
So those calls are false, again, because uh, there's a problem with the mapping. They, they're called splice site artifacts, because this is a splicing site, and this should come uh, from, from another exon. And, uh, and to minimize these problems when you work with RNA-seq data, it is advisable to use what is called a, a splice-aware algorithm. Uh, so it knows that reads can be spliced and that introns exist, and it will try to minimize these kinds of, of errors. But they will still happen because uh, the program needs to make a choice between alignment, aligning many, maybe uh, a, few, a few bases here or finding a place somewhere else to align them. And this is easier. So you have to be careful as well with these kinds of artifacts. Okay, now again, let's go and see uh, what we were talking about in DILT. So these alignments uh, can lead to false snips as we were seeing. Again, I mentioned this at the beginning of the talk uh, uh, and this base alignment quality, this back, uh, uh, option that you can add to your variant calling to lower the quality of misaligned bases. So what's happening here? Imagine that this is a reference again in, in blue, and this is your aligned reads. And what is happening here? So I have some reads that, is, that are showing me here a, a SNP. It seems like a SNP. You see AA and then TTT. I have some here, this, this three Ts and three Cs, and then I have another one here, right? And, uh, you know, the, the question is how many of them are real? And uh, the, the thing is, well, none of them are real because this is an alignment problem. Uh, and this is because actually uh, all, of these, uh, all of these blue, uh, sorry, <laughs> green squares are the same, um, the same um, sequence. As you see, they're all insertion in your, in your sample. But the algorithm chose to put them because there's similar sequence around it, around this, this insertion. It chose to put it in different places. Right, but but it shows differently for each read because the reads are different as well. So um, so it only aligned one of them correctly and the other ones incorrectly, and this gives the impression that you have uh, some snips around it when it, this is not true. It's just one insertion. You don't have this C or this T or this A as variants. They're just you know this should be aligned here and this should be aligned here, and that way you know you you remove all these holes. Um, uh, SNPs. So uh, the advice here, of course, is being careful when you look at SNPs that are close to indels. And this is why you can add this option called back to uh, what it does is where there are indels, it lowers the quality, um, the, 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 the quality scores of the SNPs that are around it. So you can ignore them when you do variant calling and those SNPs will not come um, as, as, as calls, as real calls in your BCF. Uh, and this is to help you minimize the number of false positives of you know, the alignment step around indels that is complicated. Of course, you will lose some because uh, some of them will be real, but uh, you, know, you have to make that decision and try to play with the parameters to see what is the best for your project. Okay, so you know, to all this, what does a, a good sn a SNP look like? So for example, if you have these again in IGV and you see these, um, this is nip here in, in orange and this is nip here in, in uh, green, then you can ask, is this a real SNP? How can I know this? So in IGV, you can, uh, for example, color the reads, the forward reads in one color and the reverse reads in another color um, and, uh, and, and try to display the soft clip bases and everything we have talked about uh, to try uh, and determine if this is real. So here, as you can see, well, there are not many soft clip bases actually. Uh, they're in both uh, blue reads and red reads. So here uh, you can be sure there's not a lot of uh, SNPs around it that, that indicate, you know, a bad alignment as well. So in this case, you can say, okay, so these, these seem to be too clean, but too clean calls. This, this variant seems to be real, right? And heterozygous in both cases, because some, some are reference and some are the alternative value. Okay. So, in this case, for example, you can also have uh, something that looks like this, in which uh, re, um, reads that have a mapping quality of zero. Remember, zero meant it can map to many different places in, in the genome. Um, they, IGB colors them in, in white. So all of these reads in white have mapping quality of zero. Uh, but if you see this, this call here, you can ask, is it real? Because it is in many reads that have this mapping quality of zero. So what you have to do is, well, again, look at your whole, the, all the evidence that you have 
And you can say, well, if I sort them by mapping quality, so again, you can sort reads in whatever way you want. You can say, first show me the ones that have high quality and then show me the ones that have zero quality. You can still see that this variant is supported by many high quality reads, as you can see here at the, at the top. So in this way, you can say, okay, because I have reads that are high mapping quality and also show this variant, then I can be confident that uh, it is real as well. Okay, now, we were talking at the beginning about having a set of goals that are that is enriched in uh, in true positives. So how can we estimate once you have the set of goals from your experiment? How can you estimate what the quality of the call snips that you have in your set is? Uh, for this, we can use uh, this metric that is the transitions versus a transversions ratio ratio that is called uh, known as TS over TV or TI over TV, you will find it a different, um, uh, called call dif differently by different methods, but it is the same. And it is based on the principle that, that in real life, in real biology, transitions are two and three times more likely to happen than transversions. And they have, because they have similar um, chemical structures, as you can see here. So when you calculate this and you have a, this ratio and you have a number that is actually two to three, then you're seeing that in your data, you're finding two to three times more transitions than transversions, which is something that you expect uh, in reality. So, um, whereas if you have a lot of, of false positive goals, this, this ratio will be skewed and will usually be much lower because you know all of these red calls that are transversions, you know, will, will you just will have a lot of them. So, um, if you have a random simulation and you do this, then and you can see that uh, uh, this is just going to be a very low number because you're dividing the blue um, divided by all the red, so that is you know less than one point five or something like that. Uh, whereas in normal DNA, and if you have if you have correct calls, you will see many more blue calls than red calls. And when you do this this division again, you will find two to three uh, times more blue um, uh, transitions and transversions. And this is even more exacerbated in, in ancient DNA when you have even a more um, uh, exacerbated um, uh, uh, ratio of this. So when you have your set of goals, all of them, um, some programs will calculate this on their own. Uh, sometimes you have to do it yourself, but please check this. And in, 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 in this case, you will have, if you do this, you will have an idea if your set of goals as a whole is um, likely most of them to be true or you're full of false positives. So this is a, a, a you know, a, an easy way to, to try and, and see the, the accurate, the accuracy of your set of goals. Okay, uh, I'm about to finish now, but I want to tell you about indel calling challenges. So calling indels is very difficult and you have an even uh, uh, higher problem with microsatellites, which is these uh, regions in the genome that are things like AC, 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 AC because you know, it's just ACAC, so it can map to many different places. Uh, the problem is that there's low reproducibility across colors or across different programs. Uh, for example, um, uh, a, 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 um, a paper from 2014 uh, just cited a very low 37% agreement between three colors, and this actually has not improved that much. Uh, the, the algorithms still have a lot of problems to detect uh, indels. Um, because the reads, of course, with these indels are very difficult to map and align. And, and, the, and the, the program that you're using has to make a choice between adding multiple mismatches, as we're seeing around indels, or opening a gap. And, uh, and sometimes it is cheaper for, for the program to just add a, lot of, a bunch of, of, uh, of variant calls that are not real, right? So uh, this is an, an example of what can happen. Uh, from these reads, if, you, if we see them uh, in, in, uh, in a bigger size here below, then you can see here that because you have very similar uh, two, two, two uh, sections of it that are repeated, as you can see here in blue and in red, they're the same, you can align them differently, all these reads. So you can align this repeat here, like these two reads, or you can align that repeat actually to the other read, or you can align a section of it here and a section of it here, and, and it gives the impression that you have two um, indels here. Whereas everything can be solved, you know, if you just align everything to second, and this is just, you know, a deletion here against your reference. So, but of course, 
we can see this when we analyze it, the program can choose to do this because it's cheaper for it. So um, yes, these are the challenges of indel calling and we still have uh, a long way to go, but this is why as well, um, the future of variant calling is considering other options that are not uh, reliant on aligning to a reference genome. So right now we are uh, we rely on aligning to uh, your your reference genome. You know your bound files. How does it align? That's the standard right now. Uh, but uh, uh, these programs, of course, look at site by site, and they lose information about the local haplotype, for example, and and sites farther away that can be linked to your to your variant that form a whole haplotype and that is giving uh, a lot of uh, problems and false positive calls. So there are new methods now that are being developed that uh, for example rely on, on assembling the novo uh, your, your uh, sample that you are calling so you assemble it again and you can find what the haplotypes are because you're not relying on a reference genome you're assembling uh, the novo, or these uh, new methods of variation graphs uh, in which you are actually aligning to a graph instead of, of just a sequence. So you can determine things like a heterozygous or a homozygous um, a call, but you can, you can include the linked sites and the local haplotype in it uh, because you're not looking at site by site, but you're looking at groups of sites and how they align as a whole to the reference. So um, these these uh, these methods are being developed right now, and I would expect that in the next few years we will move from this reference-based calling to this uh, graph-based calling or the Novo assembly to increase the um, the accuracy of, of variant calling. And hopefully, these indel calling problems will go away because you will now either assemble it the Novo or just say actually this is a new haplotype and it actually doesn't align to this reference, and uh, and this way you would remove these problems, right? Okay. So uh, now this is my last slide for for this uh, for this talk. So as we're seeing, um, uh, sorry, this is actually the same. But again, so the current approaches rely heavily on the supply alignment. Uh, we see only one read at a time right now, uh, but uh, we do not uh, consider the the full haplotype. So this is what's going to happen uh, later, I hope. So fine, we have finished almost to the hour, and now it's time for exercises. So you will have now two hours, a bit more actually, two, and two hours and 15 minutes uh, to work on the variant calling exercises. And in these exercises, we will see, you know, like yesterday, everything I talked to you about today, uh, hopefully you will be able to try it in your Jupyter notebook. And uh, you have to start here. So you go, you open your connection to your Jupyter notebook like yesterday, go to variant calling to the practical notebooks and to the index. And uh, uh, first, also, I'd like to say that we forgot to include one instruction. So at the beginning of it, before you start, please run this, this, uh, this command because it will make the results a folder where you're actually going to be putting your, um, your, your new files that you're creating in these exercises. And because we will use the IGB uh, in, in one part of these exercises, uh, you will need to open your, your session when you do the SSH thing. Uh, if you're in Ubuntu or Mac, please add SSH minus Y because this is going to open your graphic display, your X11 forwarding. If you don't put this, you won't be able to see the IGB. For the users, the Windows users, um, you just have to click when you open PuTTY. You have to go to the X11 forwarding option uh, in the PuTTY window and just enable it, right? That is, is the same thing for... Uh, it's going to do the same thing for the Windows users. Uh, all of this is in the instructions that, I, that we uploaded for you in the Google Classroom. So uh, please have a go and um, we'll be here if you have any